of us here this morning would want to stand before God today on the basis of God's pure and precisely penetrating justice. Who of us would be willing to do that? Willing to say, all right, Lord, I want you to deal with me on the basis of what I deserve. Is anyone here willing to do that? I think not. And I hope not. For for to appear appear before the one who, who is holiness and who is purity to such an extent that the sinless angels in God's presence continually cry holy, holy, holy as they cover their faces so that they do not look on his consuming countenance. Surely we would say, if I would appear before God, and of course we all will, maybe as soon as today, I want to appear before him not on the basis of what I deserve, not not on the basis of justice, but on the basis of mercy. We want to obtain mercy. The Lord Jesus said the only type of person who is going to obtain mercy when standing before God is that person who is himself or herself merciful. Matthew chapter 5 verse 7 is our focus today and how important it is for us to understand what this verse means. For every one of us is sooner or later going to stand before God and we therefore need to understand and know about mercy. What does Matthew 5 verse 7 say? Let's turn back there if you haven't already. Let's read the fifth beatitude which is our focus. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now, how do we understand this verse? A lot of people misunderstand this verse. We've got to be careful. I want to raise three questions and then seek to answer those questions this morning to help us get through this verse this morning. The first question is, what is mercy? The second question is going to be, well, who are the merciful? And the third question is, what awaits the merciful? Okay, there are three questions. Well, what is mercy? How do we understand what mercy is? Well, I would suggest to you the place for us to start with understanding mercy is to see mercy in its most pristine presentation. Pure mercy. And the only place that we can see pristine or pure mercy is in God. Right? It is a characteristic of God. You remember when Moses, in Exodus chapter 33, he he, he says to God, he asks God a question. He says, please show me your glory. And God responds to Moses and says, okay Moses, I will uh, cause my goodness to pass before you, but you cannot see my face and live. So you need to hide in the cleft of the rock. And I will pass by and you will see my back. And then I will proclaim to you who I am. Remember that story? Remember that scene in Exodus 34? It then unfolds when he's in the cleft of the rock that God passes before him. And and it says this, the Lord passed before him and the Lord proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, Keeping mercy to thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but by no means clearing the guilty. And so here's Moses' question, Lord, show me your glory. And, And the first attribute that God declares is after saying that he is the Lord God, the first thing he says is merciful. I am mercy. Though that does not mean that I turned a blind eye to sin. Because I by no means clear the guilty, he goes on to say. Yes, 
God is mercy. Yet Romans chapter 3 tells us, every one of us have broken God's law. We have fallen short of God's glory. Remember Romans 3, Paul says, every mouth is to be stopped. Every mouth is to be closed. Because there's no excuse. There's no say, but, but God, I did this, I did that. Every mouth is stopped. And the whole world, Paul says in Romans 3, is guilty before me, before God. Yet, God is merciful. And so much so that the mercy of God, God being merciful, is described to us over and over again in the Bible. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1 verse 3 calls God the Father of mercies. Ephesians chapter 2 describes God as rich in mercy. Micah chapter 7 verse, uh, verse 18 declares that God delights in mercy. You cannot think about God without thinking mercy. And yet the righteous, holy, just God, the very one who's revealed himself to Moses, that God remains the same today. He is rich in mercy still. But it doesn't mean that he can ignore my sin or your sin. God sees that we have all fallen short of His glory. This is the just God who must punish sin, and yet He is also the very God. He he, he sees what sin has done to us. He sees what sin has done to man. He sees what sin has done to this world. He sees that sin has brought misery into the planet or onto the planet. We see that in the media, news bulletins, all the time, do we not? Day after day we see misery reported. We know this, this is part of life in our world. Sorrow over death, suffering of disease, the pain in broken relationships, the trauma in personal conflicts or national wars. Or just distress in, in the aspect of broken hearts or shattered lives because of selfishness or, or pride or rebellion. Heartache that comes due to violence. Heartache that comes due to, in our world today, terrorism. The grief even personally due to a guilty conscience. The upheaval due to a shattered marriage and a broken family and on and on I could go. We all know what this is. Terrible misery. It's a broken world due to the presence and the ravages of sin. It's not just about our society out there. It's about you and I. It's about our lives. But God delights in mercy. God is rich in mercy. God looked down on our miserable state due to our sin and his heart was moved. So moved that he did something for us. And so we're asking the question, what is mercy? What is mercy in the first place as we look at God? Well, mercy is that disposition of the very heart of God that causes him to be moved with pity at my condition and he takes steps to relieve us from our misery. Let me put a definition to you real, as, as simple as I can as we ask the question, what is mercy? It is the heart of pity joined to action. It's a heart of pity joined to action. And what does Jesus tell us in Matthew 5 verse 7? But blessed, perfectly happy are the merciful are those who have a heart of pity joined to action, for they shall be the ones who themselves shall receive or obtain mercy, perfectly happy. Truly blessed of God are these people. And so as we come now into the second question, for us to look more closely at who these are, we're asking the question, who are the merciful? Who are the ones Jesus is describing here in Matthew 5 verse 7? 
who are the merciful, as he calls them. Well, let me put it to you this way, just broadly. What Jesus is speaking about here is not cultural or natural. This is supernatural and practical. I'll give you that again. This is not cultural or natural, but rather this is supernatural and practical. Let's just break that down. Firstly, this is not cultural. Who is it that Jesus is addressing in the Sermon on the Mount? This greatest of all his sermons. Who is he speaking to? Who is he preaching to? Well, they're Jews. Remember our study from previous weeks in Luke chapter 6 where we had a fuller picture than what just Matthew gives us in these opening verses of chapter 5? These are Jews living in Palestine. In fact, these are, this is a crowd of people, a crowd of Jews from all over the countryside. We don't have time to look at it, but you can go back and recheck. Luke chapter 6 tells us that there are Jews on this occasion who are here from the seaport towns of the Mediterranean Sea, from Sidon and Tyre in the north, and there are also Jews here from the south, from Jerusalem and Judea. And they're all gathering to listen to Jesus. You know, it's simply was not in the Jewish culture at this point. He was not the in thing for Jews anywhere, wherever they lived, necessarily at all, to be merciful. It's most clearly presented to us in the leadership of the Jews. The Jewish religionists were not inclined to show mercy for the simple reason that mercy is not characteristic of those who are proud. Mercy is not characteristic of those who are self-righteous and judgmental. Now, it's true, the self-righteous can put on a thin veneer of tenderness. But their hardness is usually evident in time. And just think about this in terms of the life of Jesus and his ministry interacting with the Jews, especially the response he got from the Jewish leaders. Incident after incident in the ministry of Jesus, Jesus is confronted by these Jewish leaders who lack mercy. You think of the, the, the times and the attitude that Jesus had, had, had to deal with when Jesus is providing relief for poor suffering people. Jesus is providing healing for the afflicted and he may have done it on the Sabbath. And what was the response of the Jewish leaders? It was that of anger. Their attitude, remember, toward the woman caught in adultery. Mercy was far from their hearts. They were there with a spirit of, judge, of, of, of judgment, as it were. They were there in a spirit of pride, of vindictiveness to get Jesus, as it were, to catch Jesus. Again and again they displayed a hardness of heart, not a compassion, not a pity, not nothing but really a self-righteous pride. And and, and if we just forget about all of that, just think about the end of Jesus' life. Think about Jesus' trial, think about his suffering, think about his death. Is that not ample evidence alone by the way he was treated by the Jews that they didn't do mercy very well? But step back just from the Jews because it's, it's broader than that. The Jews live within a Roman world. Was Rome a, a culture that abounded in mercy? No, far from it. In fact, a popular Roman philosopher called mercy the disease of the soul. Charming. The Romans saw mercy as the supreme sign of weakness. Rome gloried in manly courage, in strict justice, in firm discipline, and above all, absolute raw power. And they looked down on mercy. They despised mercy as weakness. As an example of that, during much of the the Roman Empire history, a a common father in the nation had the result of deciding whether his newborn child would live or die. And so as the infant was held up in front of the father to see, the father would have a visible response. He would have a hand gesture for them to know what to do. 
If the father was pleased, it would be thumbs up. If the father was not pleased, it would be thumbs down. What did that message communicate? Well, when the, when, when the, when the thumb was turned up, the child can live. The child is held up in front of the father and if the thumb went down, the child was immediately drowned. What Jesus is saying here in this culture is not in. And I would suggest you it's not in our culture today either. Being merciful is not the in thing. You know, every year in our country that we are told there are something like 100,000 abortions. That's 275 unborn babies killed every day. There's something like, according to the, the uh, Bureau of Statistics that I found this morning, there's something like 300,000, just over 300,000 births every year in our country. You can do the maths. That means that one in for pregnancy, pregnancy tests end in our culture in thumbs down. Surely modern abortion reflects the same merciless attitude as the Roman culture. It's not just our culture. It's not just the Roman culture. Every culture since the fall of man, every culture since the entrance of sin into this world has, has left man so self-centred, so consumed with what he or she wants, that mercy has never been cultural. A society that despises mercy is a society that glorifies in brutality and violence, as ours is increasingly. You've got a merciless Jewish religion. You've got a merciless Roman world. And think what happened when they collided with Jesus. That's what happened, is it not, at his death? Merciless Jewish religion, merciless Roman system of government. And they unite to kill our Lord. Totalitarian Rome joined intolerant Judaism to destroy the majesty of mercy. And so what Jesus says in Matthew 5 verse 7 is not cultural. The second thing I mentioned before about this as we try and understand who the merciful are, this is not natural, but supernatural. Like what we said a couple of weeks ago with one of the other Beatitudes, here in verse 7, Jesus is not talking about a personality type. You know what I'm saying? We might say, oh, isn't so-and-so a compassionate guy? <laughs> isn't she such a compassionate sort of lady? He's got such a pleasant temperament. We might assess someone as having a great measure of, of sympathy toward other people. They may have a great capacity to show pity, but they may not at all be Christians. Jesus is talking about something supernatural here, not natural, not about a personality or a, or a temperament thing. And the reason I'm saying that is because of the context. Do you remember the context? What we've been working our way through here from verse 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7, the, the Beatitudes, what are they describing? Natural temperaments? No, the Beatitudes are describing a true Christian. These are people who are citizens in God's kingdom. These are the ones, according to verse 3, who are conscious that they are spiritually bankrupt. Poor in spirit. They know that they have nothing that they can do. They know that they are nothing. There's nothing that they can seek to achieve to commend themselves to God. They therefore, due to the awareness of their sin, according to verse 4, they grieve over their sin. They are the mourners. And such are the very ones who therefore, knowing their state, they are humble, they are gentle in spirit, there is a meekness about them, their wills are in submission to the Lord and His will. 
They are always the ones who are teachable. Therefore they are hungry and knowing their emptiness, they hunger to be filled by God. As we saw last week. And, and, and of course none of that just happens by itself. It's a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit in the sinner's life. And so as a result of the mighty operation of the Spirit, giving the sinner a new heart, having received mercy from God in the heart, mercy then flows out of the heart toward others. Put it this way, in the language of verse 3 and 4, recognising our wretchedness before God, these very people are merciful toward other wretched ones. Knowing they, knowing their own pitiful state before God, they show pity toward others in all their need around them. Which brings us to this last aspect of what I'm trying to help us to see what it is as we try and understand who the merciful are, and that is this is practical. So it's not cultural, nor, uh, nor is it natural, but it's supernatural and practical. You see, mercy is not just a warm glow in the heart. It's not just a, a momentary fuzzy feeling of sympathy. It certainly starts in the heart, but it, but it reaches out in compassionate action. And that's exactly what God did for us. The God who delights in mercy, the God who is rich in mercy, did something <laughs> Yes, he's the God who by no means clears the guilty. But that's why he acted. Mercy is practical. God saw the misery of our condition as sinners. He saw our great need and, 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 and he knew that there was no way that we ourselves could resolve our state. And so God did something. God sent his son into this world to become a man. The enfleshment of God. He didn't just have compassion in his heart in heaven and that's where it stayed. He left heaven. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And Christ, the son of God, came and he himself in mercy, he shed his life's blood. He died on behalf of sinners. Why? To satisfy the justice of God. And in so doing, it was also the mercy of God at work at the same time. And so as we think of this, how these two things so beautifully, wonderfully, and maybe oddly, unite at Calvary. The justice of God and the mercy of God unite. They come together at Calvary. And we sing that song often. On the mount of crucifixion, fountains open deep and wide. Through the floodgates of God's mercy flowed a vast and gracious tide. Grace and love like mighty rivers poured incessant from above. And heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed the guilty world in love. You see, the merciful do something. That's my point. It is a disposition of the heart, but it's pity joined to action. And so what then does this look like practically for those who are the merciful on the planet? Turn with me in your Bibles for us to see an example in the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 10. It's a bit hard not to refer to this story. Luke 10 verse 30, when we consider the merciful in action. Luke 10 verse 30, Jesus is telling the story. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at that place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, 
he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine and set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two dinerai, gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him, whatever more you spend when I come again, I will repay you. Okay, there's basically four or five characters in this story. There's the guy that gets beat up, he's half dead, as Jesus said. He's in a really bad state. A really bad state. And if we lived then, it would be triple zero. You quick, get the paramedics to this guy. Like he's half dead. That's not a good place to be. And the next two characters are the Levite and the priest. And as we read that story, you see they both the Levite and the priest, men who should have known better, a Levite, a temple worker, and a priest, these guys are working in Jerusalem in the temple. That both of them, as they come to this guy, half dead, they both see him. That's what the text says. And they no doubt probably was a, a tinge of uh, pity flooded through their heart. But it passed. Because they passed. They, they passed this beaten guy. Passed, they went past him and, and yes, they may have thought as they just kept on their way to Jerusalem. Ah, oh, poor guy. That wasn't true mercy. A little flutter of affection or sympathy in your heart is not true mercy. Because mercy is pity joined to action. Enter the, enter the fourth character of the story. What we call the Good Samaritan. He was one of the merciful. Can you see it? Because it says not only did he see, not only did he have compassion, the proof that he had compassion, the next part of the, what, what does it tell us? In the end of verse 33, he saw him, he had compassion. So, therefore, because he had compassion, he did something. He went to him. He bandaged him. He cared for him. He he got that guy to the innkeeper. And then when he got there, he opened up his wallet and he threw down on the table some Roman shekels and said, okay, whatever the costs are incurred with this guy, I'll pay it now. If If that doesn't cover, I'll come back and get the bill. He threw his cash down. Pity joined to action. Do you get the point? It's a great story for us to see this fleshed out. And so the merciful are the very ones who do something practical or even financial to help those in need. Turn with me now to the book of Proverbs. The Proverbs chapter 14. Of course, the book of Proverbs has many wonderful things to say about practical godly living. And we have some things mentioned in relation to this whole thing um, of being merciful to those in need, to those in misery, seeking to relieve their plight. Proverbs 14.21 says, He who despises his neighbour sins, but... He who has mercy on the poor, happy is he. Here's the blessed one. Here's the blessed man. He has mercy on the poor. Verse 31. He who oppresses the poor reproaches his maker, but he who honours him, honours the Lord, has mercy on the needy. This is immensely practical. And so when in God's providence we have opportunity to relieve or to help those who have a practical need, what do we do? According to this direction from the Lord in practical godly living. Well, we reach into our pockets or we reach into our pantries and we do something. That's the God-blessed person. The selfish The self-satisfied, the self-righteous do not bother to help anyone unless, of course, people are watching them. And then they've got a reason to do it as a self-righteous person because they've got to give the right impression and so they'll do something. Or if another, or another way would be if they think they're going to get something from this, so therefore they will do it. Motivation is self. Not compassion to help someone out of their misery. Their hearts are closed. The merciful meet people's needs. 
Not just to ease their own conscience, but because they know what it is to be in need before God. They have themselves experienced mercy and they want to show that mercy. They want to give what they have received. They don't just simply feel compassion. They show compassion by doing something. And so how else does that look? Well, that also looks in a practical way that the merciful also are on their knees. Their hearts go out in pity and compassion, for instance, for the unsaved. And so they pray. Or maybe it's for a backslidden brother or sister. And whatever the case, they know these ones are in great need and possibly great danger. And that impacts their hearts. That's not where it stays. It's pity joined to action. It drives them to do something practical like to get down on their knees. To pray. To pray earnestly for God to intervene. To plead for God's mercy to be shown the God who is rich in mercy. They have a disposition of tenderness toward that fainting brother or sister who is maybe weighed down with some burden. Or a, a sense of pity and tenderness and compassion towards a rebellious sinner who is swallowed up in temptation or overrun by the devil. I also suggest to you it's the very attitude that shows itself in Jesus hanging on the cross. Treated horribly. Oh, ever so cruelly was he treated. And yet even as he was treated cruelly in that very point, remember his prayer, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. Father, they are blind. Blinded by Satan. Enslaved by their own lusts. How do we react to people when they've wronged us? Or people who may disagree with us or slander us? Here's the heart of Christ. Here's the heart to be cultivated in the follower of Christ. Lord, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. When there's a need among the brethren, how do the merciful respond? You remember John's words in 1 John chapter 3. He says, whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? Or also Galatians 6 says, we, as we have opportunity to do good to all, especially to the household of faith. The earlier verse in Galatians 6, the same part of the Bible says, bearing, with, bearing one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. <coughs> The very outworking of the law of Christ, that law of love, is to be bearing one another's burdens. Of course, for that to be able to happen, we have to share our burdens. Otherwise, the people of God cannot fulfill the law of Christ. Bearing each other's burdens means we should not be keeping it all to ourselves and trying to tough it out alone. No, God wants mercy to flow and abound among the people of God in the household of faith. That's his direction. And so we share our burdens so the brethren can help bear our burdens. You see, in the sense in which there's two sides to mercy. It's practical. Immensely practical. And then when it comes to those people who are not saved, oh, this is so practical here. What have we understood mercy to be? It's pity joined to action. What, what, what greater action can we engage in with the unconverted, with those who are not saved? Well, we bring the gospel to those people. That's their only hope. It's in Christ. Turn with me to Romans chapter 10, please. Because here in Romans chapter 10, the Apostle Paul is a wonderful example of this, of a man whose heart was burdened for his fellow countrymen. But we know from the life of the Apostle Paul, he didn't just have a burden. 
he actually did stuff when it comes to the gospel. Romans 10 verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. So Paul is concerned for his fellow Israelites, his fellow countrymen, the fellow citizens in Israel who are not saved. And yet there's another level of his burden. These are self-righteous people. They think that what they're doing is going to be enough with God. And he's so burdened for them. He's so desirous of them. He, he's praying for them. And he's going to them with the gospel. And so for us to be the merciful, what does that look like? It is to have mercy on the unsaved ones and that means we've got to be involved. Vitally, actively, financially, somehow in seeking to rescue men and women, boys and girls from their sins. It's practical, it's not theoretical. And so it's the giving of our time, it's praying for the gospel work. It's like, like for instance, in our case, as our, as our own church, in terms of the, and our RI teaching program, for instance. It, it'd be teaching a, teach, a, a program in that role as well. Speaking to a friend, knocking on some doors, handing out a drag, bringing people to a service, giving, giving even financially to the church so that those finances can be used to support gospel ministries here, gospel ministries in Goa, Pakistan and so on as we do. It's practical. In the midst of our culture, a corrupt, self-centred culture which is constantly nagging and shouting into our ear, grab everything you can get for yourself. And the voice of God tells us, give everything that you can. The true character of mercy is giving. Giving compassion. Giving time. Giving help. Giving food, giving forgiveness, giving money, giving companionship, giving ourselves. That's exactly what Jesus Christ did for us. True child of God is merciful. Born of the Spirit, they want to exercise mercy. They have received mercy. It has been poured out from heaven into their heart and they want to see it flow out to others. It's pity joined to action. The third question we're looking at as we bring our thing to a conclusion this morning is what awaits the merciful? Come back to Matthew 5 verse 7. What does Jesus tell us? What awaits the merciful is the question. Blessed are the merciful for, here's the reason why they're so blessed, for they shall obtain mercy. Now here, friends, we're at the point where this verse is, can often be misunderstood and is often misunderstood. To be merciful and then you'll obtain mercy. Is Jesus saying that this is about earning mercy? Works-based, merits-based mercy? Well, it might sound like that if we just reef this verse out of its context. But as we've already seen, Jesus is describing a fruit on the tree here, not a root. A fruit, not a root. Uh, let me put it the other way. This is not how you get saved. This is what the saved do. That's the difference. This is not some map where you're like, oh, this is how i got to navigate my way to get through life and to get into heaven. No, 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 that's not what the Beatitudes are. The Beatitudes are like a mirror where we can look and see, are we that person? Uh, is this me? 
This is the true child of God. This is a disciple of Christ. This is a citizen in the kingdom of heaven. This is what they look like. This becomes then a test as to whether I am of this character and conduct. This is what the saved are like. Now it's certainly true that God is good to all. Isn't that wonderful? God is merciful to all. He sends the rain on the just and the unjust. But friends, he also has a particular love for his people. He has a special love for his chosen, redeemed, forgiven people. That's the teaching of the Old and New Testaments. You say it is. Absolutely it is. You know it is. You know Psalm 103. Because David says, as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities everybody. That's not what it says. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him who are in a right relationship with him. God has a special pity, a special mercy, a special compassion for his own children. And here in this beatitude, Jesus is promising, if you like, extra mercy for his people in their future. This is a future tense description. They shall obtain mercy. And again, we've got the same grammatical construction that we've mentioned in previous studies. This is the emphatic pronoun they. So what's that mean? Well, it's simply put in English. Jesus is saying they and they only shall obtain mercy. Who shall obtain mercy? The merciful. Who are the merciful? The ones who are poor in spirit. The ones who mourn over their sin. The ones who are meek and gentle and humble. The ones who hunger after righteousness. They're the ones. Jesus is saying in this life and throughout this life, those very people will be given mercy upon mercy upon mercy. The merciful shall obtain mercy in this life. Isn't that incredible? And then ultimately its future will be seen in the final day. On the day when we will all stand before God, the merciful will receive mercy. Hmm. Are we glad for that one? You want to know the mercy of God in your life? You want to know the mercy of God in your marriage, in your family? You want to know the mercy of God upon our church? But we must know the operation of the Holy Spirit in our lives, giving us the new birth. Each of us knowing the mercy of God in Jesus Christ, saving us from our sins and the wrath of God. And then when that mercy of God is poured into our hearts, it will flow out from our hearts to others. We'll be those, not perfectly, but we'll be those living mercy, caring, sympathising, having a tender, having a loving disposition, people who are giving, people who are doing, people who are being merciful. We'll look at the unconverted, not with a judgmental attitude, but with a compassionate attitude. We may see people caught in a sin. We will not respond and say, oh, well, you made your bed, so lie in it. If that's our response, we're in trouble because James chapter 2, 2 verse 13 says, judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Are you ready for the judgment? Are you ready to stand before God? On what basis? Do you want God to give you what you deserve? Do you profess to know Christ? Are you someone who is saved? And are you ready to meet God? Well, here's the simple test. Are you merciful? Maybe you say, man, I've made a mess of things. I've run after things that my conscience told me were wrong. I pursued that which I knew could never satisfy, satisfy, but I I sought it anyway. My life is bound. I, I am chained by my habits. I'm stuck. I'm enslaved by my lusts. Or maybe it's more like the self righteous Jew. So snug in your goodness so hard in your heart 
My friend, God looks down from, from heaven today in mercy upon you. That the proof of his mercy is his son. And God offers him to you today. Jesus Christ as your saviour and your deliverer. Jesus came to set the captives free. People bound to their sin, people enslaved to their self-righteousness. Do not despise mercy, but embrace him today. Turn from your sin, embrace Jesus, embrace mercy. May your eyes see him, may your heart receive him. Has God's mercy found you? I think that's the right way to speak. Has God's mercy found you? Is mercy all immense and free? For oh my God, it found out me. Let's pray. Oh, our blessed God, as we come before you this morning, we worship and praise you for your abounding mercy. We thank you that the mercy of the Lord is everlasting. That You are a God who is rich in mercy, abounding in mercy, delighting to show mercy. And we pray that you would show that mercy today to any who are still in their sins. That you would help us who are your people to be these very ones that we have heard of this morning from your word, that we would be the merciful. We pray in Jesus' name.